So you are in the seedy side of farming talk. I hope you're in the right place. We wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update about what we're gonna be talking about. This panel will provide information and resources for produce growers and aspiring seed growers with discussion of how to select appropriate varieties for your conditions and market, conducting your own on-farm variety trials, tips for getting the best value out of your seed purchases, seed saving and growing seed as a crop, and market opportunities in the organic sector. The conversation will address some why bother questions and show how growers can benefit from getting to know their seeds and varieties. And I'd like to introduce the speakers. So we have Megan Robertson over here. Uh, she's the territory sales representative for Johnny Select Seeds. She's been with Johnny's for two years and is based in Northern California. She travels full time throughout her territory, visiting growers and attending events. She works directly with commercial growers of all sizes to assist with variety selection and ordering. She has a master's degree in food communication and sustainability from Slow Foods University in Italy and is currently pursuing an MBA at Southern Oregon University. She served as a Peace Corps volunteer in rural Kenya where she trained in beekeeping and permaculture. She's also trained in farm planning, organic crop inspection, and seed business. Megan grew up in, a South, in South Dakota and is the granddaughter of several generations of farmer veterans. And Kathleen, who's right here, Kathleen McCluskey, has worked in the Good Seed Movement for over a decade and is the Communications and Outreach Associate for Organic Seed Alliance. She leads OSA's online and print communications and is the coordinator of regional and national outreach events. She is also the chair of the Biennial Organic Seed Growers Conference. She works on food sovereignty campaigns, development of local seed libraries, research, researches the social, biological, and economic impacts of on-farm genetic diversity. She's currently pursuing graduate studies in agroecology through the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she lives in Madison, Wisconsin. And my name is Lily Schneider. I have been uh, working in food and agriculture for the last 15 years. I previously ran my own farm business in Fairfield, California and had a 15 acre diversified vegetable farm. And I'm currently pursuing my MBA in food and agribusiness management through Purdue and Indiana University. So with the intros, we're gonna start with Megan and she's gonna present, we're each gonna present for around 15 to 20 minutes and then we're gonna have lots of time for question and answer. So we're gonna hold the questions till the end. If, um, if you guys can't remember, write it down. We definitely wanna get a good conversation going a little bit later, so. All right. As a farmer, as a farmer, um, we get a lot of thanks from our communities. And as a Johnny sales rep, I've run into a lot of growers just in the last couple days who have said thank you for what you do for us, um, which is pretty special. So, as Lily said, I'm a sales rep for Johnny Seeds. I'm I have a presentation here that I'm going to maybe click through kind of fast and not touch on everything that's in it because um, that would take up all of my time. But um, So Johnny's is an employee-owned company in Maine. Are most of you familiar with Johnny's? Pretty much? Okay. The new 2020 catalog, hot off the presses, if you're signed up for a catalog, this should be hitting your mailbox next week. Um, I just had this printed off at Staples. Unfortunately, I didn't get any shipped here in time for the show, but they're on their way. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, kind of things that can help you when you are doing your seed purchases and what resources are available to you. Um, and so one of those resources is me or your other sales reps. We've got, We've got um, 12 sales reps for Johnny's that cover the US, Canada, and international ter territories. And our job is to work with growers in our areas to help 
select varieties, help with orders, answer any questions. We also have a staff in our call center that is available to you. Um, and so as you're getting started farming or have been farming for many years, it's important to know the people who are out there with resources for you. And we are one of those people. Um, so as I said, we have uh, 12 sales reps. Uh, my farms that I work with, I go from farms that are less than an acre, and I've got farms that are under an acre that I work with pretty regularly, um, up to maybe 500 acres. So I definitely run into a lot of people who say, oh, my farm's too small, like you would never, you would never pay any attention to me. But we really do. Um, you know, of course, the more money you spend, the more attention you get. Um, but we are there as a resource, and the website is there for, as a resource as well. I visited about 100 farms last year. A lot of those were very small farms. Um, up to big farms. If you ever want to check out pictures of my farm visits, I'm at Megan.JohnnySeeds. Um, so some of the things that I do with my growers is I kind of consult on um, crop and variety selections, work with orders, troubleshoot on issues, and kind of follow up and, and recommend to people. Um, so just as an example of kind of a snapshot of how I work with growers, um, I spoke with one of my growers this morning who um, was looking for pea seed. And we kind of had a conversation about how pea seed previously that he was buying was, you know, 250 a pound, but now the organic version is available and now it's up to 899 a pound and how do we work on that together? <laughs> um, you know, getting the right pelleted seeds and things like that for people. Um, so I do a lot of just kind of hands-on walking through orders and varieties and making sure that we're getting people the right things. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. There's a lot of great seed companies out there, so I'm not here to sell you Johnny's seeds today. I'm here to just kind of talk about what, you know, the process of ordering seeds and, and what to look for and, and what we can do for you. Um, so there's certainly other seed companies to look for, and there's so many out there that you want to check kind of your regional area and see what other people are using. Um, So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit just so we kind of keep moving. Um, but one one thing that I, this is kind of a loose slide in here is about the Federal Seed Act. Um, so as we're selling seeds, there is there is regulations that govern these things. Um, there is um, guidelines for how seeds are labeled, marketed, sold. Um, there are purity and germination standards that are set by law. Our company has internal standards that are higher than these, but this is just some, some good things to know as you're, if you are a seed purchaser to kind of understand that we can't and nobody can just put something in a packet and call it seed and sell it to you as seed. If you're buying seed and you're having issues with your seed, you also kind of need to know like, What's the process that this goes through? And is there any kind of guarantee or anything like that? Um, so I just copy these on. These are germination standards for everything. Just so you kind of have an idea of what, ki what kind of rules are out there around seed, because I don't think most people really know that these kinds of things exist. Um, but this is something that at Johnny's we're looking at every day. Um, and we're testing everything. So we do regular germination tests on everything. And when you order, everything will be labeled on the packet with the date and test. If you're getting germination rates that aren't in line with what those are, then it's time to look at something there. Because um, we're not just sending out packets of seed without knowing what quality they are inside. Um, so you can certainly always call us. We do take returns on things. We have guarantees on things. If you're using other seed companies, you want to check ahead of time and see what what kinds of quality guarantees or what kinds of testing they do. Um, because it'll vary from company to company. Um, but it's really important to kind of be aware of those things when you're buying your seeds so you know if there's an issue, what your rights are as a consumer to, to go back. Because you're investing a lot when you buy your seed. Seed is a live product. Um, so it's really important that 
you take responsibility for seed storage after it enters your custody. We have a climate controlled facility where we keep everything. Um, and like I said, we know we're regular testing. But if you're buying seed ahead of time, you want to know how long can you store that seed. Um, so really, we want you to be planning ahead and understanding how much seed you actually need. And I'm going to, I got a few slides ahead about kind of planning ahead. Um, and really knowing what you're gonna use. And then when you've got left seed at the end of the season, knowing how many seasons you can get out of that. Um, for some things, you wanna just throw them away at the end of the year. And don't try to do it again because you, when you plant a seed that's not gonna be producing well for you, you're investing the time, the tray space, the soil mix, all of that kind of thing. Um, if you have questions about the viability of your seed, highly recommend doing a quick germ test yourself, even if that's just putting seeds in a wet paper towel and just making sure that they're still alive. Um, but these are just some kind of rough guidelines about how long things last. So if you're looking at like onions, parsnips, parsley, and pelleted seed, those ones go pretty quick. So if you're having germination issues with those, that's not uncommon. Um, but some of those other ones can last quite a bit longer. Um, so depending on what your storage system is and how long your seed is going, if you're having issues with seed starting, that's always something to look at. Um, so a few things for types of seed to look at. And a lot of this is just kind of Things that, things that most of you figure out as you're shopping, um, but if you're new to this and you open up a catalog, which this is our catalog. There is, I, I saw a website when I was looking that said like 60 free seed catalogs. You could easily go on and sign yourself up for 60 free seed catalogs on the web. There's plenty of seed catalogs out in the world. Um, and so it's good to kind of get yourself signed up for a few of those that are relevant to the varieties you grow. Um, but you'll see a lot of codes and things in there and, and price differences on things that if you're not that familiar, they might not make sense to you. So I'm gonna kind of uh, decode a few of those things here. So our catalog, I know not all of them have this, but at the front we've got disease codes and we've got like, um, bed feet spacing and, and seating rates and things like that. So there's a lot of resources in there in the print catalog. And then as well on the website, there's even more actually interactive calculators and things in there where you can put in what you're planting, um, how many bed feet you're planting, and that can crank out a number for you for how much seed you need to buy. Um, so a couple things to look at, organic or conventional, um, if you are certified organic, you need to buy organic seed, although there are some exceptions to that that you should be aware of if you are in that boat. Open pollinated and hybrid. Um, any hybrid varieties are indicated by an F1 in our catalog. So a hybrid variety means that it has two distinct parent lines and those are bred together to create that variety. Um, so I'm not sure if, if somebody else is gonna touch on this after me, but if you are seed saving, then those traits aren't going to necessarily um, pass down from generation. And so that means that in seed production that that seed is a little bit more expensive to produce. A little bit more goes into that. So those tend to be higher priced. So if you're looking at two varieties and you're going, why does this one cost so much more than this one when they look the same? That can sometimes be an explanation, um, the open pollinated versus the hybrid. Uh, hybrids tend to be uh, more uniform and better producers. That's not necessarily a rule, though. Um, Organic and conventional, again, organic tends to be more expensive than conventional because a lot more goes into that. So if you're looking two varieties, they look the same to you, but the price is very different. Those can, those can explain that usually. Um, for other things, it might be disease packages or things like that. Um, we also do treated or untreated seed. So treated seed, an organic seed is always with the G. 
Um, so every catalog or every company is going to have a different system for noting these things, um, but they're definitely things to be looking out for as you're ordering. For us, we do treated seed with a T. Organic growers do not ever want to do treated seed. Um, it's a fungicidal treatment, thyrum, um, and that is used in a lot of areas where there's issues with seed rotting in the ground before it germinates. Fortunately for me, I work in Northern California usually, or I also cover Nevada, Utah, and Southern Oregon. So we don't have those kind of issues out there. It's quite a nice place to grow vegetables. Um, so before you order your seed, you want it to be planning ahead and looking at your market and, and really understanding what you're going to grow for the whole season. Like I said, we, as much as I want to sell you all lots and lots of seed, I really don't want you to end up at the end of the season with extra seed or things that weren't the right varieties for you. Um, so there's definitely some tools that can help you kind of figure that out. Um, I recommend if you're getting into the business, shopping your local farmer's market and talking to your local farmers. They're really nice people about what other people in your area are growing, what works for them and what doesn't. I find um, in my travels, I actually have hosted some events and gathered together farmers in an area. Um, and I'm finding that most of the farmers I work with are, are pretty well networked with their neighbor farmers. And if they're not, they want to be. Um, they really want to work together. And especially when we're talking about vegetable growers, there's enough people out there that eat vegetables that we don't need to worry about running out of market. We just need to figure out how to reach more people. So working together is certainly, you know, the communities I see where the farmers are working together, those ones are the, are the happiest and the most successful. Um, and then there's a lot of other math to do as you're, it, it's very tempting to open up the seed catalog and go, I want one of those, and I want one of those, and I want one of those, and I want to grow everything. Um, but there's a lot of math to do in figuring out the space that, that something is going to take up, calculating what your expected yield is, looking at the amount of labor. Um, some examples to kind of consider is, if you're choosing a cherry tomato versus a beef steak tomato, what's the amount of labor that it's going to take to care for and harvest that tomato? And how much do you spend on packaging that? And you know, some of those little considerations to make before you do the, I want, I want these and these and these, what do you want coming out the other end? Um, and do you have time to care for it? I know that labor is the number one issue that I hear from all of my growers right now. They cannot find enough people to work on their farms. And so we're really looking at like, how do we, how do, we do more with less? And so sometimes that, that needs to come into your variety selection. Do you want to grow baby leaf lettuce or do you want to grow head lettuce? Which is going to work better for you? What are you going to have an easier time cleaning, packaging, cultivating, harvesting, all that? And is it the right thing for your crop mix? When I talked to this grower about peas and we had this conversation where he says, you know, if the price of pea seed goes up that high, it's no longer... Not, it was never profitable to grow peas. Now it's costing me a lot of money to grow these peas, but I have a CSA and my CSA members want to see peas. So what do you, <laughs> there's the dilemma. I don't have an answer for that. Um, so again, in your planning, um, we have a lot of tools on the website. Um, how are we on time? Okay, so I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of tools on the website, and so I'm going to just kind of guide you there, and what I want you to kind of take away from this is just knowing where to go when it's time to, to pull out some tools and do your planning. Um, so we have Ask a Grower. You can email in a question about your seeds, about growing issues, anything like that, and we've got a staff there that will find an answer and respond to you use that tool, because of course you'll always have a question. Um, there's a lot of variety comparison charts, so if you want to pull up the carrot comparison chart, it's going to list each thing, um, show pictures side by side. 
these can be useful too when you're going if you're if you are organic certified and you need to be using conventional varieties and organic and comparing those um, if you need to justify your use of conventional seed you might look there um, and compare some of the traits to show how those would work for you like I said, there's quantity calculators, there is seed starting date calculators, succession planning calculators, um, all sorts of good stuff in there. And then you wanna look at choosing things that are most adapted to your variety and your growing system. There's also a lot of codes in here and there, and also when you're choosing a different seed company and different catalogs, there might be ones that are specific for different things. If you're growing in a greenhouse or a tunnel, um, a protected culture system, an uh, aquaponic or hydroponic system, those might have different needs. Um, so it's important to look at all of those things as well. Um, these are just some of the different factors. So when I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, they said, well, it's really about just the temperature, right? And, that, and I'm like, well, that's just one of many things. It's not just about the temperature, so it's not just if I live somewhere hot or just if I live somewhere cold. There's a lot of other things to consider. I would say disease pressure is probably one of the most important things. So this is the disease code chart that I showed you. Um, and you really wanna be proactive about controlling disease on your farm. So. One of the most important things in variety selection is varieties have different levels of disease resistance. It's an important thing to know. Um, so if you're getting into farming, finding out in your community, from your extension office, from your other local farmers, kind of finding out what diseases are prevalent in your area. Um, like I said, in California, it's a nice place to grow because it's dry, because moisture has a lot to do with it. Um, so if you get into areas where it is humid, mildew becomes a real issue. We have some issues with mildew as well. Um, but this will help you choose some of the varieties that are resistant to disease in your area. Now, one thing I'll say too that I find people who have been growing for their whole career and still don't do this or know how to do this, if you suspect disease, if you have disease, send a sample to a pathology lab and get it diagnosed. Um, some areas have free pathology labs, uh, some you have to pay. So it's good to reach out uh, your extension agents or local people should be able to kind of guide you. I think in Maine, where Johnny's is based, we have a free service there that you may be able to access from out of state, but I'm not exactly clear on that. I've heard mixed things. Um, so those are, some of, those are some of the things that we just wanna look for in selecting varieties. I suppose that means I'm out of time. So I will pass this on and then we will have questions at the end and I hope I get a chance to talk to you guys some more. Like a two-handed situation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna wander too. I've had so much coffee. How's everyone doing? Yeah, thank you um, for inviting me to be here from our Veteran Coalition. Um, as Lily said, my name is Kathleen McCluskey. I work for Organic Seed Alliance. Um, has anybody heard of OSA, Organic Seed Alliance, in here? I thought I saw some familiar faces. Um, so OSA is a nonprofit organization. We train farmers to learn how to be seed stewards. We uh, train folks in how to save and grow seed. By grow seed on their farm, I mean use uh, grow seed as a output, as a um, uh, integral part of their system, not just within growing to keep seed for replanting next year. And then um, how to breed new varieties, which is particularly important in organic systems because many varieties that we see in the marketplace are bred for conventional systems and they're just two very different sets of needs usually. Um, and we also have an advocacy program that generally works at the federal level. Um, 
advocating for national policies that strengthen organic seed systems. This includes a lot of um, advocacy for research funding. Uh, the organic um, seed research is really not keeping pace with the amount of organic acres that are planted and the amount of organic food that's being um, sold on the marketplace. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, shifting, pivoting a little bit from Megan and seed selection for your farm, and talk to you a little bit about some of some of the things that we offer to growers who are interested in learning how to produce seed, what drives growers to our resources, and um, how you can get started if that's something that you're interested in. Um, so. Uh, economic opportunities, environmental benefits, NOP is the National Organic Program Compliance, and um, exercise roles and rights as seed stewards, and access to varieties. Uh, this is farmer Nash Huber. He's a uh, producer, an organic producer, diversified farmer up in Washington State. Um, highly diversified farm, including animals and vegetable and grain. Um, and uh, Farmer Nash has been a strong partner with OSA for years. Most of the research we do in variety trialing and plant breeding is done in partnership with the farmers that we work with on their farm to see real world examples of how things are functioning and the systems that they're working in. Um, so Farmer Nash got to interested in seed um, through uh, sort of a, a little tragic uh, year for him in that he was really, really well known um, for his carrot varieties that he produced um, throughout the whole Pacific Northwest. Um, really successful, his customers really associated this carrot variety um, with Nash's organic produce. And one year, Nash flips open his catalog to find that the seed variety is no longer being offered. The company that he was purchasing it from was purchased by another company, and they dropped the variety. So Nash, being a good grower, had a little bit of remnant seed that he started planting out. And this was a real wide um, kind of um, realization moment for him that this was opening him up to a lot of risk on his farm, that he wasn't going to be able to address and meet the needs of his consumers. Um, so he started breeding carrots uh, from that variety and um, essentially developed his own new variety that is totally dialed into his farm, what his cultivation practices are, what types of soil he's growing his carrots in, the whole gamut. Um, and now he's got Nash's best organic carrot variety. He controls the variety, he controls the quality of the seed, he produces it on his farm, and he is all set year to year. Now, Farmer Nash has a very large um, land mass, a pretty big farm, pretty big operation. That's just, um, you know, we start you guys with variety trials, and then that's the hook. And then you end up breeding new varieties for yourself. It's always my joke. Um, so that's, uh, I think that that's just a really great example of what we see with a lot of growers coming to us for understanding these skills and gaining this knowledge of losing varieties, wanting to have things that are well-suited to their region, to their farm. Um, the second thing that I wanted to talk about was the economic opportunity of why farmers uh, come to us to grow seeds. Now, obviously, Nash is a good example of an economic opportunity, but there's also, um, and I, I maybe should have started with this, in that or the National Organic Program, the seed requirement right now, if there is not organic, an organic variety available for something that you are growing, you can use conventional seed. Um, and the, the sort of trick on that is that there's not enough organic seed being produced and available that is in quantity or quality to meet the needs of organic growers. So um, we have the Organic Seed Alliance has a project called State of Organic Seed. Um, we measure the progress in increasing availability, quality, and quantity of organic seed available in the U.S. And we publish our findings every five years. So um, Essentially, this large gap in the amount of organic food that's produced, food and fiber, that's produced in the US in, and the lack of organic seed that's available there is a really strong economic opportunity. It's a market opportunity for 
growers who want to produce seed and want, who want to produce organic seed. There's a lot of need out there. Megan, are you? Yes. <laughs> um, we would definitely work with a lot of growers who contract for Johnny's um, and many other seed companies around. Um, so these are just a few charts. This whole report is available online at stateoforganicseed.org. We break it down into different sectors, different crop types, how much um, seed is being reported uh, as being organic that's used in the farming system. Again, it's just kind of a nice ability for a roadmap to see where some things that you might be interested in growing that might do well as a seed crop in your area, where you might be able to find some good marketplace for that. Um, and this is uh, uh, this chart is showing the um, difference in small farm organic seed usage to larger acreage organic seed usage. A lot of this we're seeing is um, organic grain avail availability, uh, particularly in maize, which is really um, for several different reasons is really lagging and having quality organic varieties available. Um, and I'm going to uh, share just a f several resources for you all, for people who might be interested in, in learning how to produce seed or learning how to save it and grow it. Um, one thing OSA does well is offer a whole lot of resources for free. <laughs> um, we have put considerable energy into making those tools really relevant and easy to filter through because we've got a lot on our website, which is seedalliance.org. Um, we have over a hundred how-to publications and webinars up there. You can download them for free. Um, and really from a range of beginning seed saving and seed production to how to breed your own varieties for your on-farm usage. Um, broken down into several different crops, mostly vegetable right now. Um, and um, many webinars from our biennial conference uh, that we broadcast live from and then make available after. Um, we also have a seed economics toolkit, which was a particularly exciting lift to finally be able to put together some resources and do some hard data. There's really not a lot, there has not been previously to this, a lot of data for the organic seed sector. Um, this is also all available online. There's the link below at eorganic.org. You can find it from the OSA site too. It includes ed enterprise budget templates, tracking forms, and then a webinar from a seed, an economic seed intensive that we did at the Seed Growers Conference two years ago, which was a day-long intensive that covered everything from how to select what, what seeds will do well for production in your area and on your farm to how to uh, contract negotiate with seed companies, um, how to create a farm business plan for seed, how to track your labor, and then a lot of resources that you can download, like a lot of Excel spreadsheets that you can download for free and use on your farm. We also have the um, Organic Seed Producers Directory, with it, which is a networking tool that connects um, seed growers who want to grow for sale um, and um, contract grow, or excuse me, with a uh, uh, wholesale buyers and seed companies. This is all free as well. Um, this is just a glimpse today. I almost didn't want to put this up here because there's nobody from Texas. Um, so, but again, veg seed. So, this tool is filterable. It's got a profile for all the farmers that are signed up and easy contact information. And it's really just an opportunity to try to connect that gap or fill that gap with seed availability um, in the overall system. Um, and then the Organic Seed Growers Conference, which I've already mentioned a couple times, is a biennial conference that's hosted by Organic Seed Alliance, but it is highly participatory, so it really does draw all of the different um, sectors and actors within the organic seed world. Um, it is the largest event focused solely on organic seed in North America. It draws about 500 people or so, mostly from across North America. But it's just such a fantastic way to meet other seed growers, to meet other people who are interested in learning or pros that have been doing this for years. Um, and we also have like a lot of fun, like a lot of fun. 
you should totally come. Um, this year is one of our on years, so it will be this February 12th to the 15th in Corvallis, Oregon. There are scholarships that are available for pe beginning growers. Um, beginning grower is considered 10 years or less of farming. There will be an application online when the registration launches if you're interested in um, applying for that. And then a uh, seed garden book is, um, this came out a couple of years ago between Seed Savers Exchange and OSA. This is another really great resource for um, just the, the basic how-tos. It was written for a gardening audience, so if you're really new to seed and you're really wanting to kind of get your hands wet and trying a few different crops or something like that, it's a great resource. It's also beautiful to look at. Um, and this is sort of our go-to list for advice for beginning seed growers. Um, start small, start with something you love because you're gonna give it attention. Obviously start with something that's gonna do well in your climate as a seed crop, so you gotta do a little bit of research. We definitely have some publications on that. And I think probably Johnny's website would be a good start there too. Um, you want to definitely track time, inputs, and income to make sure that it's something that's a viable economic opportunity for you on your farm. There again, you don't necessarily have to be selling it as a crop. You can just save it. You can save it and replant, so you're reducing your inputs the next the next year around. Um, I always recommend that people do annuals instead of biennials first. Uh, not, you know. No spinach, no spinach the first time around. You'll go mad, and, and then we'll lose you. Um, and infrastructure for drying, that I feel like infrastructure sounds more expensive than this really needs to be. There's like a ton of great hacks on how to dry seed in bulk, and um, you can find tons of videos on YouTube, on OSA's website, on probably most small seed company websites. And I think of particular importance too is meeting other seed growers and sharing information freely. If there's one thing that really stands out in the organic seed world, it's that people almost like overshare their information. But they're, you know, seed companies will share their contracts. Seed companies are always looking to sit down with growers at our conference and, and really like explain what that process looks like. Um, seed companies talk about what genetics they use. They talk about what techniques they use, what parents are in hybrids, how to grow hybrids as a seed lot. Like it's really, um, people are out trying to, trying to lift everyone else up around them. So it's a pretty, pretty open sharing community. And with that, I will thank you and looking forward to hearing questions and chatting more. Thank you. You're fine. All right, while I get this set up, I wanted to ask you guys just a couple questions about the audience. How many of you are currently farming? All right, we got a couple current farming. How many of those have been farming for more than three years? Great. And then anyone, is there anyone in the room that's growing seed currently? All right, so a couple, excellent. Okay, so like I said before, my name is Lily Schneider. I previously farmed, uh, had my own farm in Fairfield, California for 10 years with my husband who's over here. He's like the first veteran that the FEC worked with uh, back like 11 years ago. So um, if you've been to other functions, you probably recognize him. <laughs> So a little bit about my farm is it was located in Fairfield, California. We grew 15 acres of certified organic vegetables for CSA and farmers markets. We had around a 300 member CSA, uh, five to seven seasonal employees growing over 35 different crops and um, probably each year over 100 different varieties. We tried a lot of different varieties over the years, kind of weeded out the ones that didn't work that well. Um, so just thinking about uh, what are some considerations when you're trying to decide what seed to grow, um, like looking through seed catalogs. Uh, number one is matching your production goals to your marketing goals. 
thinking about what is it that your customer wants and how are you going to be able to provide that by growing different varieties. It's great to grow all kinds of different stuff that you personally love, but if you are not able to sell that to your customer or to find a customer to buy that, then you're not going to be able to generate income off of that, which if you're a hobby farmer and your goal is not to make money, then that's okay. But if you're in it to, for your livelihood, um, and and to increase your bottom line at the end of the year, then the things you're growing need to make money. So if you can't sell it, you probably shouldn't grow it if you don't want to invest the time and energy into creating a market for that product. Uh, succession plantings, different varieties will behave, or uh, the same variety will behave differently if it's grown in the early season, mid season, and late season. So if you have, for example, a carrot that does great at the beginning of the year, it might do terrible in the summer. So you, so you wanna think about what are the varieties that are appropriate for the different seasons. Uh, climate adaptability and what does well in your area. I think both of the previous speakers did a really good job uh, emphasizing the importance of networking with your peers and asking. Um, go to the farmer's market, talk to people, what are they growing, what has worked well, what hasn't worked well. Also, if you're thinking about growing something, asking your neighbors, have you tried this, have you not tried this, um, did it work, did it not work? Um, where I was farming before, we had a pretty warm summer climate and we really wanted to go bro grow broccoli to be able to put it in our CSA boxes and we asked our neighbors, some of them had more like truck farms with farm stands like, hey, have you ever grown broccoli, cauliflower? And everyone was like, oh no, it doesn't work in this climate. So we knew not to you know, plant the whole 15 acres with broccoli and cauliflower, but we also decided that we were gonna try a little bit every year, try some different varieties, see what worked out, and in the end we did, we were able to produce it, but not going in, you know, 100% and planting a lot of something if there's some uncertainty around that. Uh, other considerations are yield, so dependability and consistency. Uh, if you're going to invest the time and energy and space into planting a variety, you want to know that you're going to get a return on your investment for that amount of land and all the uh, monetary investment you've made. So I personally grew a lot of hybrids uh, on my farm because if I felt like if I could plant one seed that I knew, you know, it was going to be more consistent, they were all going to come on at the same time in terms of harvest versus having um, some more variability. And that, of course, depends on what kind of crop you're growing, but it's definitely something to take in consideration, thinking about that if you need to be able to actually grow enough uh, in a stable manner to be able to sell it and make money off of it. And quality, that is flavor and shelf life. So flavor is really important, but it goes back to what your customer wants. Your customer wants something that tastes good, and your customer also doesn't want it to go bad after the second day that they you know, have brought it home from the farmer's market. This obviously is going to vary based on who your customer is. Um, so it's just something to keep, into, keep in consideration. If you're thinking about doing variety trials in a production environment, um, it's a little different than um, like a research farm or an actual seed company doing variety trials. Um, it's easy to do, but you have to be organized and you have to be able to follow through. So we started out on our farm doing some seed trials for Seeds of Change back when they were more of a production-oriented company. They've since kind of transitioned into more of the home gardener market. Um, so we did melons and peppers, and that was really interesting to just see how that was set up. So first you have to decide how much to plant and how many varieties you're going to try. And you want to plant enough so that you can see how the variety performs. So if you just have one plant and the plant dies, then you're going to be like, oh, that, that variety was awful. I'm never going to grow that again. But maybe there was another reason that the plant died. Maybe it wasn't because the variety was bad. It was because there was a gopher in that spot. So planting enough of something to kind of get a good idea of how it does. Um, 
flagging varieties in the field and labeling them. If you are trying, if you're trying something and all the varieties look very similar, then you just want to plant them in a way that if for some reason all the labels and the flags disappeared, you would still be able to tell what the different varieties were because um, if you have employees and they're out in the field working, they may not know why the flags are there. So uh, keeping a good record of like how many bed feet of each variety you trialed, what was the order, um, if there's any defining characteristics of those varieties. And also taking into consideration the layout. So if you have a crop that you harvest um, like a whole bed at a time, you want to make sure that that is communicated back to the employees, that there's different varieties in that bed, and that it, they, it needs to be assessed before the harvest happens. So it sounds kind of obvious, but in the summer, like when things are really fast paced, um, you may forget that you have a variety trial going on. And so making sure the communication is there with the people actually working in the field that this is, this is different, this is special. Um, we need to have a little bit more uh, eyes on the ground before we harvest this crop. and assessment of variety trials. So kind of going back to what I just said about the decision maker needs to assess the trial with the big picture in mind. So if you are a business owner and you're the ones that you have a special reason why you're growing this variety and you ask your employee to go assess the varieties but they don't know that you know these varieties are for the special customer that asked for like a beet that uh, is like yellow and red striped on the inside they may say hey this beet sucks don't grow this beet anymore uh, so knowing the big picture of why the variety is being trialed in the first place and being able to relate that back to the marketing side Harvest techniques and requirements can vary by variety. Uh, this is especially true with melons. Uh, if any of you guys have grown melons, you know that some you harvest when the stem slips off, some you have to cut the stem uh, with watermelons, some they get like a yellow spot on the bottom, some they you know have a special sound. So just knowing that each variety kind of has its own characteristics. Also with tomatoes or cherry tomatoes, some of them, they need to be harvested with the calyx. Some, the calyx can come off and the tomato won't split. So um, it might be, you may have to go outside your comfort level and try to figure out, okay, I really like this variety. I like the way it tastes. I like the way it stores, but I am having trouble figuring out how to actually harvest it and also communicating that back to your employees so that they know this variety needs to be harvested in this way so that it's actually marketable. And then if you're interested in trying new and unusual varieties and you find something you really like, if you're gonna be growing it on a large scale, thinking about if you're willing to um, invest into that marketing of a new and unusual variety. Maybe if you're working with chefs, you know, they always like to try new things. It'll be easy for them to kind of incorporate it into their rep repertoire. But if you have a CSA or farmer's markets or you're doing wholesale, it might be a little harder to communicate that back. Um, <laughs> This is, the, this is the most important member of the farm team, Mr. Silky. <laughs> and just a, a couple more thoughts. Uh, when you're looking through the seed catalog, just remember that a lot of the descriptions, I mean, when you look through the, jo the Johnny's catalog or any of the catalogs, it's like the way they describe the stuff, it just makes you want to plant everything in there. Um, so just kind of taking the descriptions with a grain of salt. So I remember there are a couple things like there's this Alibaba watermelon that was like from Iraq and it's just like everything about it. We really wanted to plant it and we grew it and it was just for us. I think it does better in other parts of the country, but for us it, it didn't do well at all. So that was an example of something that in the seed catalog it looked great, but then in reality it was it was like the worst watermelon we ever planted. And then on the other side of that, uh, Johnny's, I don't know if the description for the Crimson Sweet Watermelon is still like this, but it says uh, standard shipper. 
And we found that the Crimson Sweet Watermelon was like the, the best watermelon that we could grow on our farm. So it's just like, you, you gotta just get out of your comfort zone and like try every last thing. Um, talking to your peers is good, but you know, sometimes maybe they haven't tried the things that you wanna try. And if you can be first to market with a new variety, then that's really valuable too, so. All right, I think that uh, concludes the presentation part, so we're gonna start taking questions. Who has questions? I have questions if you guys don't have questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. My question to you, what is it, Oasis Seed? Organic Seed Alliance? Yeah, so uh -huh. Um, so let's say you want to be a part of that, but your land isn't certified organic, but you're growing in better than organic practices, can you still be able to supply seed? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Am I supposed to repeat it for recording? Yes. So the, Okay, so your question is if you are um, following organic practices, but you are on um, transition or non-certified organic land, can you still supply seed for Organic Seed Alliance? Um, so it's a good question, and I maybe could have been, I could have clarified more that, so Organic Seed Alliance, does we do not sell seed. We empower farmers to be the seed producers. Um, so I would say that you would need to connect with specific seed companies um, if you were wanting to produce seed as a crop for them. Um, is you Are you going through transition? Are you planning to certify the land or you're not sure? I don't think I need to. Yeah. It's like I'm pretty transparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes they need it if they're marketing out of their area. Yeah. They need to be certified organic so the people buying it know that it's certified organic. But if you're marketing locally, you certainly don't need to be certified organic. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, so that's what I, I, you know, before going down that road, um, we're, we're creating like an heirloom growers association in like middle Georgia. Awesome. So we're, looking to kind of regionalize seeds um, in a way that, you know, have historical relevance mm -hmm. and also, um, you know, local relevance for our chefs that we work with. But, you know, not everybody wants to go through the or organic certification to actually do that. And, um, you know, even if we developed our own seed company or I know the greater picture of this is hey, we might develop some really cool seeds that folks may want because they're organic certified. You know, how does that all play into the world? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And the, um, the answer that I have is, so we work with growers throughout the country and really it's folks that are gathering together, like you're saying, in a particular region to basically develop strategies and seed systems within their area. And in some areas, folks have markets that require organic or they're serving organic customers or they're selling for, you know, like the Pacific Northwest is a good example. I mean, so much of like the world's um, brassica seed is produced in the Pacific Northwest because it's a great place to do it. So there's a incentive there for growers to, who are trying to serve the organic seed company um, to certify organic and produce organic seed. But in the Southeast, we've been working with groups of growers for over a decade now who really just want access to their own seeds and, and culturally um, significant varieties like you're talking about. And so there, the skills that we share aren't necessarily, we actually debated at the beginning of starting Organic Seed Alliance 15 years ago, not putting organic in the name of the organization. Because we find that the skills are really appropriate for conventional growers too, right? Like to save a seed is to save a seed. Um, I mean, there's obvious, I'm oversimplifying that dr drastically, of course, but 
to learn to classical plant breeding methods are classical plant breeding methods, like how to, de to develop a variety or just working in different conditions. So I, I would say that if the, in your region where your, you and your growers are working to create the seed system or add to the resiliency of your system regionally, if your market is for, you know, if you can market it as, um, again, like culturally significant or historically rel um, significant to that area, th and you don't, there's no require, you know, if, pe if your customers aren't asking for organic, then go for it. We definitely have plenty of resources that can help you all out. Um, and yeah, I, I would say that. Can I chime in? You can. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if you're not certified organic in that situation, then you're conventional. Because what you're trying to do, if you're trying to grow seed for somebody else to then market, they can't use the word organic, they can't imply that it is organic. It doesn't matter if you're using organic practices anymore because that, unless you are certified, like that kind of goes out the window. So when you're saying, I don't think I need to be certified because I'm very transparent, that works if you are selling directly to your customers and you have that relationship. But once you put somebody else in between you and your customer, so if you're trying to grow seed for another company, that message can't go through them anymore. They cannot imply that the seed is organic in any way. Um, so if you want to continue to grow uh, with organic practices and you want that seed to be considered and to be used by organic growers, then I would really consider certifying. And if you are not going to certify, then just be ready to accept that you can't communicate that the what your practices are in other ways. Uh, Megan, where does this? Oh, do we have a, we had a real question? Sorry, yeah, my question for yeah. Megan also. Yeah, sure. Um, so you said that you visit farms, so we want to know what, why. Why? <laughs> yeah, and what do you do when you go visit? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so. And who gets to visit? And it's kind, it's kind of haphazard. Um, so <laughs> I travel full time, and what that means is I don't have a base anywhere. I have no home. <laughs> and I know, let that sink in for a minute. I've got a post office box and a Subaru Outback. And my. <laughs> yeah. That's all you need, right? My Subaru is full of farm tools. So I have all of these hoes and tilter and all sorts of good stuff. And so my area that I cover, I kind of just roam through there. And when I have events, I go to those events. And then I kind of go in between and, and land somewhere. So I might land somewhere for a couple weeks or maybe just pass through. And sometimes when I go to conferences, I will meet people at conferences and I'll say, oh, hey, I can come to your farm. And they like, yeah, I'd love to show you this or that. Or sometimes I just show up in town and I've got a whole list of customers and I just start calling people and say, hey, can I come over for a visit? And fortunately, you know, we've got a really great reputation and people are very welcoming. Uh, and so that's kind of how I have uh, done a lot of that is it just happens to be whoever is in the right place at the right time. And why I do that um, is because it helps me develop a, a sales relationship with our customers. You know, primarily I am, I am a salesperson. Um, but also it helps us understand what the needs of growers are. And Johnny has, has historically, and I hope well into the future, been very uh, adapted to the needs of farmers and has been really responsive to what our growers are, are looking for. Um, so for me, going out to people's farms, I get a chance to really see what it looks like and what's going on there and have some really deep conversations. I rarely have a farm visit that's less than two hours. And sometimes it lasts to dinner and, and <laughs> evening. And because, you know, it's, a very, it's, it's such a beautiful community, all <laughs> small growers. Uh, and then the tools demo has been a big part of that as well. So I've got a lot of the tools that we use. And that's been amazing because that gets us out in the field and working together. Um, 
And so it's really, you know, it, it helps me present products to sell, but it also helps Johnny's gather feedback on what our growers are doing and what their questions are and what they're using. Um, and for me, it just warms my heart <laughs> to get to go and spend that time on farms. So I've got um, all of my colleagues, um, there's about half of us that are out in the field and nobody else travels like I do. I invented this, this is not a thing that <laughs> other people do. Uh, but a lot of them work in our headquarters office in Maine and so they spend most of their time on the phone and emails with their growers. And you know that's good too, but for me to have a chance to actually know all of these people in person and build those relationships has been incredible. Yeah. Um, okay, I just ordered a whole bunch of seeds probably about six months ago from Johnny Seeds. <laughs> and I just looked through the catalog in my life and all oh, that's pretty, that's pretty. <laughs> I heard about that. But we haven't planted anything yet. Can I talk to you for a little bit? You tell me, well, it's a hydroponic greenhouse. And we're trying to do cucumbers, oh, okay. peppers, and tomatoes. Yep. And like I said, I just flipped through and picked stuff that was pretty. We actually it. have a whole section for um, greenhouse. Yeah. And there's a little symbol that's a little, right, yeah, I see a little right. raindrop that says hydroponic. So I was saying kind of look for those. And so, did you look for that when yeah, you were talking? Yeah, we see all different varieties of all different stuff. And I'm thinking I'm better off just getting the right seeds from the beginning instead of just throwing it. Truly. I mean, it really, I, like, that's, I, that's kind of the, <laughs> the, the key. I don't know what yeah, it is. Did they return their seed if they need to after they talk? Not in six months. <laughs> I'm worried about too is the germination and all that, and that's why I was kind of taking this. And yeah, be and better off just starting. You should be fine, um, but yeah, that is the one kind of the message that we want to send you home with is it's important to do the trials and do the planning and put that work into it um, to really. We want you all to be financially successful because otherwise we don't get to do this anymore, none of us, and so you know. I think that's kind of what everybody's talking about. I know there's other sessions going on right now um, about financial uh, business planning and things like that. Because at the end of the day, if you can't make money on your farm, you don't get to farm anymore, and we don't get to come here anymore. Like we're done. Um, and a lot of that goes into like, yeah, shoot, you know, planning, making sure you're getting the right amounts, the right varieties, all that kind of stuff. But Did you make a little just sell? Just I mean, we're growing seeds. Just growing like, seeds? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like right now, I'm in the, we just got the greenhouse built. Yeah. And we're going to try and get people to come and get us like a farm stand. Mm -hmm. And then, would I be all right to find to try and grow seeds? Although, I don't know, you know, depending on your system, if you've got a high tech system, you're really going to have to look at like how how do I have how, what do I have to do to pay the bills so on this system? Um, and that's going to be different than what do I have to do to pay the bills on a field that I own or a field that I rent uh, or a tunnel or other things. But if you catch if you catch me outside of panel time, we can talk more specifics about your system. Yeah, I'll just I'll add on to the consideration of your system to the seed crop. It's important to remember that the crop stays in the in the ground longer, so because it has to come, it has to go to seed and then start to dry down. So it is out in your field or in your system for a longer period of time. Yeah, I get a lot of people who ask about, um, you know, shouldn't we all be saving seed and 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 instead of buying seed? And for most of the growers that I work with, they're growing you know, 50 to 100 different varieties of vegetables. And to save your own seed on 50 to 100 varieties of vegetables is not, that's not feasible. You're not gonna do that. Um, so for like a mixed vegetable grower, if somebody ever gives you a hard time about not saving your own seed, you can tell them to take a hike. <laughs> and save seed on a few varieties that you wanna save seed on or whatever, but don't let anybody uh, put pressure on you because I think there's a lot of idealists out there who aren't real farmers who kind of can go like, well, everybody should do this or everybody should do that, or whatever. And do what you can, you know. If you want to buy your plant starts from the nursery, you're still a farmer. You don't have to ever buy a seed. You can buy all your plants as transplants. 
and put them in the ground, there's plenty of work for you to do between there and market to still call yourself a true farmer. You know, there's if you want to cut a corner here or there um, in that way, cut out part of the process, sell wholesale instead of doing the farmer's market, whatever. Whatever makes money, you still a farmer. <laughs> and to add on to that, like when you think about producing seed to sell, it's like that is like a whole professional career in itself. And so just because you're you know growing vegetables doesn't mean that either like A, you're gonna be successful growing seed, or B, you're gonna be financially successful. So it's like a whole separate enterprise to your business. So it's definitely good to think about like if that's something that you're willing to invest the time and energy into. Um, also like the seed it gets tested, there's like germination standards, um, there's all these other things to learn about the seed industry in addition to just like growing crops to sell the crops themselves, but growing the seed is like, it's a whole other layer added on. So it's definitely another um, layer of complexity. I get a lot of people who ask about growing seed for Johnny's who have never grown seed before. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not your entry level seed grower company. <laughs> Yeah, so um, going back to w what we're trying to do with the Heirloom Growers Association is um, like I work with about 40, 50 chefs in the state of uh, Georgia and uh, Atlanta. Um, and we sell a lot of produce to them, um, you know, livestock and things like that. But we've also developed this kind of like idea that in order to truly have like a local food program, you have to have a local seed program. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that um, to take seeds and, and and not depend on um, the seed companies to actually grow, but I kind of I'm seeing like with global warming and, and and a lot of movements with climate change that a lot of seeds that are traditionally well, a lot of plants that are traditionally uh, grown in parts of the world really need to be climatized for drought. You know, need to be climate, you know out up in the uh, in the Northwest, you know, there's a lot of brassica, things like that. But who knows in the next decade or so what that climate's going to be changing. Like we're talking about snow going in California in the next like week or so. Like it's kind of ridiculous. But um, but then I'm also thinking about you know just as a total novice, the um, even if we are growing seeds in our region for for our communities. We also need genetic diversity being pulled in from other areas as well to kind of keep those uh, seeds stronger, you know. And so you take those seeds, and you put them out, you get them back, and you continue to grow, always improve. So I, that's just kind of like thinking out loud about you know what what we're trying to do and and how we um, help. But one one other thing, if a um, organic grower takes non-organic seeds saves those seeds on organic plant, will those seeds now become organic? Yep. Only if you're sort. I mean, like, basically, unless you go through the certification process, nothing's organic. The word organic cannot be used on anything unless it goes through that certification so you're process. Yeah. So if you take a non-organic seed yeah. and grow it on your property and you save those seeds, are those seeds yeah. now organic? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, you can yes. start with yes. conventional. As long as I'm certified. As long as you're certified. Yes, sir. And it would also be, you would have probably only deal with people that kind of share the same value for you know, with, with that as well. And so that, that would be a way for us not necessarily wanting to go organic, like if there was another one. Like, you know, this costs a lot of money and time for like small growers who want to really pay attention to like doing seeds and everything. Following like biodynamic practices to like totally certify the organic. But if there was a grower in the area who had an organic farm that was willing to take those seeds into right. bring it, that would be a viable. That would that would be total business sense for us to mm -hmm. to deal with that. You well, know? I'll talk with you later if you want about this idea. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So we can talk about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just, this I'm a seed geek, man, so that's yeah, like, you know, that's, that's cool, that's good. Um, yeah, this is a good segue. I just wanted to just ask Kathleen, um, what makes a seed organic? Yeah, so basically it, it's, the seed has to be produced under all of the same 
principles and guidelines that an organic vegetable or organic grain crop has to be produced under. Um, and that's sort of like the, and I know you just got back from certification training, so jump in if you'd like, but that, that's sort of the, the base level. And then we also work with growers on for, for on-farm plant breeding skills. And that, which I touched on a little bit when I was talking, in that there's also this, a, there's a mechanical piece of breeding something for an organic system where it's not part of the certification. It doesn't make something organic necessarily, but it makes it, it makes it be quality. It makes it produce well, right? Like we do not want to make farmers, organic growers have to grow organic seed that's low quality just because it's organic. Like right. that's not going to allow a farmer to be successful. So we work with growers to breed things like like carrots, in for example, that. Um, uh, are emerge quickly and grow a canopy quickly um, to help shade out weeds so there's less mechanical um, weeding that needs to happen. These sort of um, traits that can really flourish well in an organic system and, and give a grower a, a one up on, on just having quality genetics that's going to do well on their farm. So that, that goes into this sort of next layer about like what makes something organic besides just the main practice of not putting herbicide or something on it, right? Yeah, I was just going to be really quiet in this class and just listen. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't not say something. Because this is really good, this whole thing about seeds. Um, I was an organic inspector for five years. And before that, I was a farmer. And before that, I was in the amphibious Navy. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, let's take a an example. Let's say you have an um, heirloom bean down in Georgia. Maybe it's called uh, who knows what. Fingerprint fava. <laughs> Fingerprint fava bean, okay? But it's not listed as an organic seed in any of the companies, yeah. right? So if you can find a farmer who's certified organic, give them some of that, give that farmer some of that seed. He or she can grow it for a year or two. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes certified organic seed yes. from bean seed from his farm, his or her farm, if that's what you need. But if you don't need to be certified organic, once again, you can just call it an heirloom fava bean mm -hmm. seed. Gotcha, yeah, sure makes sense. Because it, I mean, there's so many beans out there, like Rockwell beans from uh, Whitney Island mm -hmm. that were brought over from like Germany in 1860. You know. They're growing Rockwell bean seed, and, and we grow some on our little farm, and it's not certified organic seed, but if my customer wants Rockwell beans, and I'm certified organic, I can't find a certified organic Rockwell bean seed. I can grow it yeah, yeah, on my organic farm, as long as it's not treated. Yeah, see, that's uh, more GMO. See, we're working with uh, uh, farmers out in Zimbabwe, right now, uh -huh. um, just to really wow. kind of find some of those. Well, indigenous seeds, that's where my focus yep. is at, right? And so I want to work with uh, farmers uh, who, like indigenous groups, who, who save seeds yeah. from generation to generation. Yeah. Um, and so, because um, a lot of the stories and a lot of the traditions have been gone because of GMOs have really like taken over a lot of that. But there's small yep. groups of folks in, in these parts that have this stuff. The same thing with Afghanistan. So we're you two need to connect. Yeah. Um, the Organic Seed Alliance and you guys need to connect yeah. because even though you're not quote certified organic, yeah. they're doing some really cool stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. we work with lots of girls. And that's, and that's so kind of what they do. Yeah. See, for us, for me, it's more important to <clears throat> develop seed, not so much for the utility aspects of it as far as I'm focusing more on taste with culinary aspect. Yeah. It might not be a big producer, but what I want to do is yeah. take like the, the high flavorful seeds or produce that we have, yeah. grow those and then work on production and then hopefully someone like yourself who has an organic form can say, hey we can grow this sure. for production. Um, yeah. And that's kind of where I'm at right now with all of this 
this whole process? It, it's a great I, it's a great place to be because every researcher that I've ever worked with and every grower that I've ever worked with looking for that are growing for flavor, which is most of our growers are small, organic, diversified growers. It's like you can you can breed disease resistance. You can breed these yeah. agronomic yeah. traits into stuff. You cannot breed flavor into yeah. something. Yeah. You have got to start with flavor yes. and then work your way out from yes. there. That's so the, that's the your exactly. yeah. We, we can't like I can have production seeds and I can't increase the flavor in that you know. And so and that's what I was talking to mm -hmm. John. Like there's so many heirlooms out there, and I love heirlooms, but there's a lot of them that just. Heirlo the word heirloom is kind of like the word artifact or antique. It just means it's old. It does not mean it's good. It's not any, like, it doesn't mean it's going to taste good or anything. It just means it's old. So even as a... In, Hang on, we've got one next to you. I just, well, I was just carrying on this conversation. Yeah. I want to make sure I'm hearing clear, clearly. So if I, if I buy non-organic seeds from John's yes. and I have an organic farm, the seedlings become organic. Um, I mean, when you plant yeah. a seed. Well, the fruit from or the uh, produce from the yeah, seed. Yeah, organic. But if, it's, it's if the seed organic. is treated, if it's conventional treated, then yeah, the fruit from those plants are not organic. Uh, really, this is something that, like, before you make any decisions about yeah, that, you should be clear right. with your certifier because mm -hmm. your certifier is the person who, who exactly. represents the seed. But okay. you are, as a certified organic farm, if organic seed is available on the commercial market, you are required to use organic seed. Yeah. If it's not available, there's an exception for conventional seed, and then you can take a conventional seed and you can plant it, and anything that comes out of it is organic. Yes. What, what it means is, if your customer only wants Rockwell beans, and you can't get certified organic Rockwell bean seed, you can still plant Rockwell seed, bean seed, and then those beans become organic. One thing to keep in mind when we are having this conversation too is, um, and I can't, I can't take a deep dive into this because I'm not that knowledgeable, um, but it's about intellectual property and, and um, what kind of restrictions there are out there. Um, so for example, that's a totally different session. <laughs> about codes in the catalogs if you see anything that says PVP that's plant variety protected that means that there um, is a protection on that that you are not allowed to reproduce and sell that seed right. you could reproduce that you could save that seed and use it on your own farm but you do not want to take one of those PVP varieties and grow the seed out and then start selling that seed because right. then you would be infringing on the right. right. There are farmers that have been prosecuted for that. And there are a lot of models of intellectual property protection um, that are being looked at in sort of the non-large company models. Um, PVP is one of the classics. There's also an open source seed initiative, Aussie, um, that are are looking to develop licensing that's more like open source software. Um, but basically, the issue is whether or not you can save it year to year, because some of it you just can't, and then some of it that you can save year to year and you can breed new varieties from it and eventually commercialize something that's uniquely different than what you started from. So there's definitely a bunch of different layers to it. It's a really good point to it. Yeah, and my understanding with the PVP is if you do any, you can, if you can use that as a breeding material, and if you use that to breed with and breed something different out of it, even if it appears visually the same, um, that is a different product and then could then be sold. But like I said, I don't have the expertise to lead a discussion on intellectual property and seeds. And it, it really is its own whole conference. There is there will be three workshop sessions at the Seed Growers Conference that focuses on this actually, because it's a really big um, concern. Utility patenting is a real big problem that now we're seeing organic companies starting to do as well. 
um, and utility pack just locks down that seed altogether. And is it true that as a seed save, like you're saving seed, let's say all of us are saving seeds here, um, Cherokee, purple tomatoes, right? And from all over the country, and we're selling you seed companies buy a pot pound, and so we send it to them. It's not like they take you know his seed and separate it and sell those big packs. They just put everything in one particular pack, like you know, uh, like huge fat. So there has to be a lot number associated with everything and so I think that there's kind of different points in the process depending on what it is. It's not like it's not like you just take a whole bunch of stuff and just dump it all together without knowing where it came from. There's quite a bit of traffic. The reason why I ask that is because um, I can grow the same plant and go in and I am an avid taster of everything on the farm. And I'm tasting you're gonna this. You're gonna select for that really tasty tomato while your neighbor who's growing it might not. Well, well but he, I'm tasting a plant that all came from one pack and they all taste differently oh, from that, her plant. You know, and so it's kind of right. like, how does, it, how does that even happen? That's I'm plants, I mean, but I could just, I, they're all individuals. Yeah, these are living, breathing beings. So we're not their saying, own personality. So what I'm saying is like most folks are not saving for taste. It's more for like I don't know, I think a lot of people are. I mean it depends on what your what level you're at. Like, you know, with our breeding programs at Johnny's, like that's number one. We don't we don't mess around with anything that doesn't taste good. If it doesn't taste good, they toss it out and start over. Um, there's a lot of other things that are important too. Uh, but if you're looking at, you know, this level that we're at, um, this community that we're all working in, there is a lot of people looking at, at flavor, and that is a, a very important. Now, when you get up to the mass production, um, you know, you get down to Salinas and that area where, where most of our country's vegetables are produced, they are looking for different things. A lot of the work down there is, is directed toward processing. Uh, a lot of the breeding has to do with how do things fit in machines and yeah. stuff like that. And that's, you know, because they're trying to feed the masses, but when you, at the farmer's market, we're looking at tasty vegetables. <laughs> Did you have another question? I do. I have, I actually have a bunch of questions, but, but <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time for all of them. I'll talk to you after. Uh, so this is for Kathleen. Um, so, uh, this, I just go on the side, but I wanted to learn how to do this, or do you class someplace, do you go? Well, this is the process. I got distracted by the time. Yeah, um, I can be distracting. Uh, you weren't distracted. <laughs> so we have a lot of, so you can visit the website and go to our publications tab, which is on the home page, and there are tons of publications, webinars that you can tailor towards what you're looking for by crop, by location, by if you're looking for variety trial results, things like that. Then we have um, the biennial conference that I said that's in Corvallis every other year. Um, and that is really like the main training. We do like three days of intensives prior to that and then kind of dive deeper in the main conference. And then we do, we probably two um, in-depth plant breeding, like fundamentals of plant breeding workshops every year. And we travel around and do trainings on seed production and seed saving. Um, that is largely uh, driven by communities or regions coming to us and asking us to come and do it. Uh, come and, and usually what we do is, like we, we really work all around the country and so we have partners throughout the country and we hook up with a partner organization or other growers that we've been working with, maybe farmers who've done some on-farm plant breeding and we've helped with variety trials. And then, you know, usually one member of our research team will come in and, and kind of co-lead a training, a uh, skills-based training on how to do that. Um, so it is, it depends on where, where you are. And I mean, certainly a group of growers, a few farmers, maybe a university, like your extension agent, if like we're happy to come out and travel and, and bring what resources we have and, and help, like co-host workshops. And there's certainly regional seed summits that are happening, which is really exciting to see the organic community
growing at that place. So we have the conference every other year that's national in scope. And then on the off years, like there's one in the Northeast, we just hosted one in the Midwest. We also just co-hosted one in the Southeast. Um, there's one that's been held in California for the last six years or so where growers that are interested or already doing seed production or trialing, we kind of just help them come together and host a summit to identify needs in the region, strengths in the region, just whatever we can do to support the regional seed system developing and strengthening. So it's good to, it would be good to get on our newsletter list um, and we send out stuff by region too when we've got upcoming events. We don't sell your names. I'm the holder of the list. We do not trade anything. Yeah. I, I might say something about the Army Seed. Um, they have in their catalog a whole bunch of tools that are ergonomically good for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're, they've been designed by Elliot Coleman and other people who like Big Bertha, we have a Big Bertha, which is uh, it's a no-till thing. You stand on the close feet, pull it back, and then you go it's down and do pull it back. <laughs> I love that Big Bertha. It's great. Yeah, so you know, some of the, some of you don't know, they've got really good tools. Well, thank you. <laughs> That's what I get paid to do. <laughs> what, no, I haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone.